We're here for another episode of Clean Tech Talk with myself, Zach Shahan, CEO of Clean Technica, Matt Pressman, co-founder of EVNX, and David Havasi, former Tesla, I called you a Johnny Appleseed last time, I know, you, <laughs> former Tesla Johnny Appleseeder from 2012, 2019 at Tesla, so very big years at Tesla. Um, and we're talking about, again, the changing U.S. electric vehicle market, but this time today we're talking electric trucks. So we're going to talk the Ford F-150 Lightning, which just was revealed today. And the Tesla Cybertruck, of course, will come into it. I've got another EVNX Cybertruck shirt on today. The second nice. Last week I had a different one. And uh, <laughs> this one's gray and black instead of pink and purple and white. And um, the Rivian for sure. Uh, so let's get into it. Um, the biggest news the Ford F-150 Lightning, we'll focus around that. Uh, David, what is your, what's your first overview impression of the Lightning, uh, the, the main thing that jumps out to you? Main thing right off the bat is price. That was the key thing that I was looking for. And I love, to, I love that they're able to keep it, the 40,000, you know, the hair under 40,000. And that's before uh, any, any tax incentive. So that was a huge deal because part of me, you know, I got, you know, we've gotten our hearts broken before, uh, you know, there's, when you come to the, when it comes to the electric pickup truck market, that is the products that have been unveiled so far. Um, of course you have Cybertruck, we can talk about that later. It's a different thing, but then, you know, uh, Rivian and Hummer, both who I, I think are amazing machines, but their price points, take it, take them out of relevance for a massive majority of the consumer. So when you start talking about something that's, you know, 70, 80, $100,000 for a lot of the consumers, it might as well be a million dollars because it's simply not, it's not in the pie chart for them. So, so that does two things that's, that's, that's damaging. One, they go, they go, ah, you know, I'll, I can't get that. So I'm not even going to look into that. But then two, it, it, it might instill the false impression that all electric vehicles are too expensive and too premium. And so they excuse the, the possibility of, of adopting uh, an all electric or go, moving into all electric because they looked into it one time and they said, I looked into it, it's just too expensive. And so that's, that stays in their mind. And uh, but what's so exciting about the F-150 Lightning is if you're looking apples to apples, if you're going down the spreadsheet and you get to the all important cost and you say 39 and change, then they go, hey, well, that's, that's not unreachable. You know, that's kind of, uh, you know, that's uh, particularly pickup trucks are, are getting expensive. And so that when you start seeing that, now, granted, that's for the standard one. I'd like to see more of the standard specs. Or, you know, kind of yeah. dive into oh, them deeper. Yeah, I think I didn't. Um, uh, yeah, the, the, it's it's 230 miles on that one range. Okay. And okay. 300 miles for a long range, but I don't know what the price is on the long. We will find that out probably uh, right before this podcast goes live or something. Yeah. I, I, well, and it's obvious that they, they um, uh, at least with their long range, the, the mid-range Cybertruck was their benchmark. Because you look at a 10,000 10, pound towing capacity, um, zero to 16, four and a half seconds. These, you know, 300 miles, like you just said, driving, you're like, oh, these are the exact specs of the all wheel drive, the mid range Cybertruck. So, you know, okay. Um, yeah. The big so thing anyway, for me was, yeah. was that price. That was a shocker for me. Because um, basically everyone commenting on it before. I think has been expecting fifty thousand, sixty thousand, seventy thousand dollar truck. I don't think anyone was expecting Ford to come out with a forty thousand dollar electric F one hundred and fifty. Which so this is a big shocker to me. It blew my mind. Um, yeah, two thirty miles of range, not three hundred, but still, that's enough for a lot of purposes and uses. And uh, and it's the quickest Ford F one hundred and fifty ever. It beats the Raptor, so that's big. Matt, what are your what are your takeaways? Your biggest uh -huh. takeaways? Yeah, to me, definitely the price was the, was the big headline here, right? So the, the price coming in, you know, under 40000 making it uh, attractive for pickup uh, buyers out there, uh, going directly against the Cybertruck's base price 
um, was the big, I think, takeaway. But what I found surprising was this intelligent backup power. I thought, you know, creating this feature where you've got a, almost like a backup generator for your house with your truck um, is going to be a super attractive feature that uh, I think they may have an edge on Tesla on this one because Tesla, from what I've gathered, only wants to use sort of their backup through their power wall through a separate product, basically. They don't want to use their cars to, to provide backup powers to, to, to the house. So if Ford does, in fact, move forward with this intelligent backup uh, power uh, feature, um, then they've got a they've got a real edge right there and a really cool you know kind of like feature for for their truck that, that you you're not going to get with uh, gas powered trucks, um, so it's like a backup generator for your house. I, I think that's really cool. So I, I like that the most. Yeah, I talked with uh, I just talked before you talked with Darren Palmer, head of BEVs for Ford. Um, he was on the founding team medicine uh, team um, and now leading up the the initiatives. And uh, he was excited about a lot of things, like the point that it was quicker than a Ford F-150 Raptor, quickest Ford F-150 ever. But I think he especially lit up talking about the backup power feature, which is really exciting. It does differentiate. And what one thing he's really excited about, I don't know if I mentioned it to you guys, um, the charging capacity of the truck, it's got a dual charger and it's 19 kilowatts. And that's also that goes both ways. So that can go 19 kilowatts into the truck or 19 kilowatts into the home from the truck so that gives wow. some serious backup that's capability so that's really a different i mean volkswagen is also talking about vehicle to home but it's not uh it's not at 19 kilowatts yeah <laughs> yeah yeah i mean that's something that's been that's been uh you know bantered about for years the vehicle to home capability for tesla could they ever do it and the nissan leaf did it uh, in, in some in some test uh, cases, and I think that's a really cool feature. And um, you know, I can't wait to see to learn more about it. I, I'm really excited about that one. Yeah, and I guess the, the the funny thing, or you know, not not coincidental, is that the price point does basically come in at the lower end of the Cybertruck price point. But you know, just to come back to cost for a minute, if the tax credit doesn't change in the United States. They Ford still has seven thousand five hundred dollars tax credit available for its buyers. So right. you can bring that down to almost thirty. You know, you know, with other incentives, perhaps thirty thousand on electric truck with you know serious Crazy. capability. What do you, you know? What do you think? Where do you? I mean, I don't know the truck market. I don't know how much you guys know the truck market. How do you think that? Do you think that starts to really eat into Ford F one hundred and fifty sales from other you know power other powertrains? Well, as, as you know, uh, the key barrier to EV adoption is education and awareness. Because if people truly understood the, the benefits of, of going electric and were able to demystify the misconceptions, it is a no-brainer. It is a no-brainer. So it's just a matter of education. Basically, it's, it, the, the OEMs are in a really interesting position because how do you start selling one product that is way better than the other product that's comparable that's also on your lot you know the electric equivalent to the gas is is going to be superior in practically every metric so it's it's just a matter of education as far as i'm concerned because once once people uh get demystified and get all their misperceptions addressed it it is really a no-brainer i mean so if you look at um and we've heard uh, a couple people even in ford uh, talk about this. Ted Canis has talked about this. Darren Palmer has talked about this. If you look at use case scenarios, particularly with fleet vehicles and fleet trucks, yeah. uh, they, uh, in, in like an agriculture or uh, a regional fleet vehicle, they know how far that truck's going to drive in a day. You know, it does its little route. It hits its little, um, you know, if it's a regional service that they provide, they know exactly how far that truck's going to go. And at the end of the day, it parks in some kind of terminal or whatever that is. So if you can put a plug at that terminal, you're not worrying about gas depots. You're not worried about oil changes. You're not worried about belts and filters and spark plugs. And, and with diesel trucks, the, the, the mixture that a lot of people don't know that you have to add an additional mixture to diesel trucks. We had at Tesla, our delivery trucks were Ford F-250 Super Duties, our, our first delivery trucks. We loved those trucks. Uh, the, and the diesel engine uh, was, was, a, was a beast. 
but it took some it took some maintenance. And if you could take that out of that equation, the, just the fleet element alone, um, it's going to be a big deal. It's going to be about consumer education, though. Yeah, I agree. You want to say some more on that, Matt? Do it. Yeah, no, I think I think the big thing really is going to be the like you were saying. The big thing is is our fleet's going to adopt an electric uh, F-150 because if they do, um, that will be a game changer, and not just for Ford, but for the whole industry. Um, I mean, there's been a little bit of uptake in fleets with Tesla, um, a, a little bit, not nothing substantial really yet. Um, so I think this could be the very first that has major uptake uh, in fleets uh, because of the Ford name and their reputation and, and the familiarity with the brand, uh, where they may be a little bit more standoffish with Tesla potentially. So yeah, this could be huge from a fleet standpoint for Ford. And big fleet uh, sales, you know, history and networks. Yeah. And yeah, I, he did, uh, Darren did mention fleets a bit. It was the fun thing about talking with Darren is he's head of BEVs, head of electric vehicles. So he was, you know, talking about them like we talk about them. And he was like, you know, he was ready to throw, you know, throw the competition in the, in, the, in the dumpster and have the electric you know, F-150 Lightning take over, it sounded like to me. Um, so it was very fun to talk with him about that. And he did highlight, I, I, we got into, we spent some time talking about the, the origination of the T-Medicine group and what they were tasked with. And he pointed out that he says Ford is all in. They want to produce as many EVs as they can, as they can sell. Uh, this is not a joke. That's why they put Mustang brand behind it. That's why they put the F-150 brand behind it, because they said, we're not doing compliance cars. We're going to sell everything. We're going to see what we can sell and sell everything we can. So right. from that perspective, it seems like they're going to ramp up production as much as the market asks for. So we'll see. But, um, you know, that's very exciting, especially considering the, the low price point. The, you know, like you said, there's a lot of fleets. I mean, work trucks, there's a lot of work to do for people who drive work trucks. So, you know, you drive, you do a lot of work somewhere and you drive again. So I think even the 230 mile range in my, you know, I, I'm sort of biased because I've been on this for years is I think that would be adequate for a lot of use cases. But um, yeah, uh, any anything else on this or should, should we jump to some other electric trucks? Yeah, I mean, I just obviously a good segue into that is Workhorse, right? The, 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 the Workhorse uh, pickup truck company uh, that, you know, they're, they're really trying to, to cater to fleets. And so, again, I, I think Ford's thinking not just about competition with Tesla, but potentially with some of these upstarts. Um, and, and, and that's a good thing, you know, and, and again, the F-150 brand, you know, or, or just, just everyone knows it. So it's going to have a lot of resonance, I think, with Ford buyers and with pickup truck buyers very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I remember so, um, we took an F-150 in, uh, when I worked at Tesla, we took a, it was like a tricked out F-150. It wasn't even tricked out, it was factory. I mean, they didn't actually modify it, which is a testament to how Ford uh, crips the vehicles but I, I had to take a trade up to tampa and it was a ford f-150 was a few years ago and i remember thinking I, I mean, it just felt so solid it felt so good and um controls are pretty intuitive you know for <laughs> for a non-tesla and um i remember thinking god if it was just only electric this would be so oh if this had an electric car train so it's really exciting to see they I like how they're taking a, a Ford is taking a, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know, with the sync. I think they're using sync, the fourth generation. Um, they're going to they're going to use the same as the Maki -E has for the, yeah. the touch screen and the um, yeah, it will have uh, mobile phone, cell phone as a key phone as a key like Tesla. Um, yeah, Blue Cruise. Which is there? Yeah, so that's cool. And, and I think I think workhorse is, um, you know, we're we're getting more information on workhorse. The thing about, and I'd like to hear um, all of your opinion on, you know, they have they're they're using the um, in wheel motor. Isn't that workhorse doing that? And so you have that whole unsprung weight element. And I've been a lot of my industry friends I've been talking about, it, and they're like, how is that going to work? You know, unsprung weight, particularly on a truck, because 
uh, I'm just going to go on a little tangent here because we're talking, you know, since you brought up workhorse and we're talking about electric truck space. Here's the thing about unsprung weight. When, when you have when you have a piece of machinery in a chassis, you can have the suspension diffuse the kinetic energy of terrain. But if you have unsprung weight, which is weight at the wheels, so if you put the powertrain in the wheel, all the kinetic force, all the G's that the, the G force that comes from the tr terrain, 100% of that, except for the the flex of the tube of the tire, gets transferred to the mechanism. Yeah. So if you go off roading. If you have a, an engine in a compartment, like a conventional engine or an electric motor at, a, at an axle, it, it's being diffused by this, the suspension. But if you have unsprung weight, every bump, it's like, it's like you're putting the motor in a washing machine and <laughs> shaking it up. So for, from a durability standpoint, I'm like, uh, and then of course there's performance elements too, putting weight over the tires like yeah. that. Um, yeah, we. Uh, it can be challenging I, for them. Yeah. I is it? Did they partner with Protein, perhaps, or or I, I feel like that's who I covered. I I was introduced to Protein at a conference in Barcelona in 2013. 2013, uh, so eight years ago, and I thought it was a really interesting topic. We wrote about it a bit with theirs and other. But you know that debate was always happening about that that topic, unsprung weight, some other topics, um, and it never went anywhere. And then there's yeah, I think they, I think that's who partnered with Workhorse. Um, I'd have to check. But basically, I've heard some claim that they've solved that. that they found a way to solve that issue. But you know, there's a lot of claims before mass production and, and mass, you know, consumer use. Um, there's all kinds of technologies that might even be 99% good, but 1% flaw ruins them for mass market, you know? So I don't, I don't know. I'll believe it when I see it, I think, but, uh, but I would go back to Ford in that respect too, because sorry, sorry to go back to, but Darren, Darren Palmer was pointing out that they've tested the heck out of the lightning and they've really, and they've done a lot to actually improve the battery cooling after testing it hardcore, going up a 25% grade, towing a ton of weight, and realizing they have to do a better job cooling the battery down or something on, in that scenario. But one thing they highlighted was either doing tests with truck drivers and the guys are freaking thrilled. Like, like you were pointing out earlier there, the truck drivers were like, Holy cow, I can just go so effortlessly, so quickly up a hill tilt towing, you know, 6,000 pounds or whatever. It feels like nothing like it's just so easy and effortless and it's so smooth you know it's like so they're blown away by the power the capabilities of the electric powertrain for this use and they're really testing it hardcore and getting it ready for you know ford knows how to do that <laughs> they, they know how to test a truck and make sure it's going to be ready for heavy duty use so they're very proud of that and i think that's going to be an interesting thing to see is how um all of that work goes into the the you know the messaging they do and the um, the market response, but jumping to another truck, I guess uh, we'll get to the cyber truck in a moment, I guess. But uh, the the Rivian um, R one T is coming out. Uh, a lot of people are very thrilled, excited about this vehicle. Um, it's got all kinds of cool features as well. It's got this really cool tunnel, um, like uh, what's it called? It's a tunnel that goes under the 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 bed behind the the cabin, sort of, and it's like. You can store a lot of stuff in there and lock it. And um, they just have a really a lot of cool features and a very good following right now. People are really thrilled about Rivian and, and what it's bringing to market. The downside, of course, for me, which turns me off big time, is just that the price is high. But, um, you know, you got to start somewhere. And uh, I think it's cool that they're starting with an exciting product. I was not into it initially. I thought this looks too much like a a, a hippie yuppie uh truck uh you know we need something that looks like you know this going to compete with you know the ford tough or you know ram you know and and i was like well this is like this is just fitting into an ev stereotype but as it's gotten along and i've seen all the features and how much people are into it i'm really excited about it and i realized the truck market is ginormous and there's all kinds of people who buy trucks and a little bit of differentiation on this market would be great, you know, so everyone doesn't have to buy the same freaking truck 
uh, even if they're from all different backgrounds and cultures and style preferences. So what do you guys think about the Rivian? Yeah, I think, I mean, you know, Rivian to me really kind of got their, their, um, their niche with this sort of outdoorsy adventure travel, like coming way back in the magazine era, back where, where I, when I started, there was this magazine called Men's Journal and another magazine called Outside, you know, all about sort of adventure travel and, and living the outdoorsy lifestyle and camping and, and skiing, you know, and what vehicle would be right for that. I mean, the Rivian just plays exactly into that market perfectly. The look of it is, is, is right on with that market. Um, the functionality of it with that little tunnel is such a cool feature. Um, all the camping sort of uh, accessories and the like. I think, I think each of these trucks, you know, workhorse being more for fleets, right? Rivian being more for this adventure outdoorsy type. Um, the Ford F-150 has this massive advantage because it's the, lead, the market leader. So it's going to automatically kind of, I think, very quickly get the lion's share of the pickup truck market. Um, I think Tesla was brilliant in not trying to do that. They tried to really create this, you know, futuristic armored military looking, you know, outer space vehicle that just looked like it was from Blade Runner. And just totally took a, a niche that w no one was even thinking about. It's sort of really avant-garde. And um, also, you know, at the same time with the vanguard of what could be the future of pickup trucks. Um, so I think Tesla's got their niche. Um, you know, Bollinger, I think another one's a little smaller. It's got that kind of Jeep look to it. Uh, GM went with the Hummer, which is, this, again, sort of this big, you know, military looking vehicle more sort of from the past as opposed to the future with with tesla cyber truck so i think i think each of these uh trucks uh is carving out its own sort of brand identity and and i think it's going to appeal to a different segment of the market and i think that's a good thing you know the more electric trucks we get out there the better so i think it's great yeah, that's really interesting. I hadn't thought about that so much. It was a really great presentation. You really have all of a sudden all these electric trucks arriving and they're all different, fitting a different niche, which is really cool. That's a really exciting thing. And with the Rivian, I was just, I kept thinking about Subaru. Like, is yeah. Subaru going to be okay? Yeah. <laughs> David? Well, and well, I, yeah, I think Subaru will be fine just based upon on price point. Um, who, who, should be, who should be sweating it is like um, Range Rover. Because right. that's really, that's, I mean, it's basically, if you look at price points and, 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 and demographic, it's Range Rover, like taking, taking your high end SUV to, to Vail or, you know, or, or up to, to Utah for some kind of wine tasting excursion <laughs> on the top of a mountain or something, you know, uh, eating, you know, drinking organic goat milk and on your, on your, you know. <laughs> <laughs> open on your you know with it with it with your trailer with your with your llamas that you've raised you know <laughs> and uh like that that's that market um and which they've which they've really nailed which i think so i think i think i think range rover sh should be sweating it bullinger is another one where man that thing would be awesome if it was 40 50 grand right. but isn't it it's pretty it's pretty expensive, right? The Bollinger? I think it's six figures, right, Zach, or no? I remember seeing that and going, Gil. Right. <laughs> you, know? you know, but the, the irony of the Cybertruck is that it it is undoubtedly unique. Are we but going for the Cybertruck now? Let's, stop. Oh, Let's go. We're going for it. We're oh, going we for it. Go okay. in. Yeah, that's right. Is this that's the right. I just, I'm just okay. going to mark this so that anyone who hates Tesla and hates our commentary on Tesla, because there are some people who hate all three of our commentary on Tesla, you can just check out now. We're going to talk Cybertruck <laughs> for a few minutes. Okay. We've go given ahead, a David. lot of love to the other drugs. I think the, the irony of Cybertruck is that on one hand, it's so incredibly unique by design, by its physical appearance, but by the sheer num order numbers, it's going to be ubiquitous. And so it's going to be everywhere. And so it's it's like, if you want to be unique, it's almost like you don't get a Cybertruck because like there'll be so many around. Yeah. <laughs> it's, going to kind of, it's kind of a catch-22 of like, um, uh, I, I mean, gosh, I mean, just in our neighborhood, you're not special if you drive a Tesla anymore. It's not it's not, not at all. Um, not at all. <laughs> you're know, like you're driving a Like I, like I, I always, I've, I've said this, this 
this kind of story before when I lived in Lakewood Ranch, but I would go up to the Tesla service center to operate, you know, 60 miles north. And I drive on I-75 for about 50, 60 miles. And when I first came down in 2013, uh, uh, you know, I was, I was with Tesla uh, for a year up in New York and I came down and I'd be thrilled in 2013 if I was driving north, if I saw one Tesla in 65 miles, I'd be thrilled. I'd be like, whoa, I, we're getting them out there. We're getting them out there. Then I got transferred to the UTC mall here. My commute was five miles. So I went from 65 miles to five miles and it got to the point I was shocked if I didn't see a Tesla in a five mile drop. And in fact, and, and Zach, because you know, we both live in the same hood. There's a Tesla in every intersection. They are ubiquitous. And now granted, we live in a particular market that, that, that caters to that. But I think Cybertruck's going to be like that. It's going to be like, ah, I don't want to be another person with the Cybertruck. If, you know, somebody like me, who's an extrovert, you know, I want to, I want to stand out. I'll make a statement with it. Part of me says, well, maybe I'll get a Rivian. <laughs> it'll just be, it'll just be like, oh my be like God. cool, a Rivian. It's not one of those yeah. stupid Cybertrucks that are all over the place. No, no, I, I, mean, still, I have a Cybertruck reservation. In fact, I have a couple, but uh, and I'm going to wrap it in, in camo with uh, safety orange rims. So let's get that straight. It is got, cyber truck standing out is good. I think all going to be about how people wrap it. Yeah. Well, um, I think I think I think there's word that Tesla is partnering with 3M or someone to um, potentially offer you know uh, custom wrapping from the factory. I'm not sure if that. I feel like that's going to be a thing. And it, I, there is a question of how much people are going to pay extra to wrap it because a lot of people are excited to wrap it but it, on the other hand it looks so cool unwrapped and it's extra yeah. to wrap it uh, i will say i have no involvement in cryptocurrency i'm not it's not my thing but i'm very tempted to get a cyber truck and wrap it in dog coin dogecoin uh <laughs> wrapping like that is just that's like that's, fan, that's the fanboy that'd be the ultimate that, fanboy movie. that just would be so funny yeah. i mean i would of course my wife would not permit it but um you know well the car the car, <laughs> the car say it's lends accident. itself it, i mean the flat surfaces it's it's like a blank it is it's a blank slate so it kind of lends itself yeah. to expression you know um and, the, and you're right I, there's there is a purity to seeing the the um stainless yeah. steel there's yeah. there's something really pure about that um but i think people are going to want to make it their own yeah, no, I think I look, the Cybertruck to me is going to be the ultimate marketing um, victory for the company. It's, it's just so unbelievably odd, like you're just awestruck when you see it, even on the screen, let alone like seeing the, the footage of people in New York City who are not shocked by a lot, by the way, having lived in New York for 20 years. It's like they don't really get very awestruck often and seeing their reactions when they saw the Cybertruck driving down the streets just shows you how it's going to just be a jaw dropper. You're going to see it. And you're going to go, oh my God, what is that? And so I think, you know, any vehicle that is outside the norm from a design standpoint and really stands out um, brings attention to the, to the, to the brand, to the parent company, which is, which is Tesla. And so, you know, Tesla from this, this point, you know, really with the, with the Roadster, with the S, with the X, X a little bit with the Falcon wing doors, obviously was a big statement, but it's, it, that's unless it's parked and you're seeing it, it open up. Other from that, all the cars look pretty much like other SUVs or sedans that you see on the road. There's not really too much differentiating them. Cybertruck is an absolute like design statement. And I think it's going to be the best thing that Tesla's ever done to help put their brand on the map in a huge way. So I'm super excited about it. I think that's going to be the big deal. And whether yeah, or not we, you wrap it is just sort of a personal preference thing, you know? Whether or not you wrap it, yeah. Yeah, I think you and I have very similar look at the marketing side of Tesla and the, the, that kind of, that realm of society in general. I think David as well, actually. I mean, all three of us. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that, I, those are exactly my thoughts on the Cybertruck. Well, speak a little bit more. I'm, I'm here, curious to hear both of you. You both lived in New York City for a while about the Cybertruck going through New York because it was just it looked so in the in its element there it was amazing driving through the streets and it was shocking that New Yorkers were take you know shocked by it because like, <laughs> what can you talk a little bit more about what just happened in yeah in New York Matt you yeah, can start yeah, with I, you since the little bit that I saw the footage that I saw on social media you know just seeing people kind of like you know breakneck you know looking at the Cybertruck when they saw it in Times Square 
um, again, like Times Square, it's like you, you can see anything at Times Square. It's, it's like a crazy place. I mean, you're used to always being shocked and awed in New York City by, by what's going on around you. So to really stand out and to cut through the clutter and to, to grab someone's attention the way the Cybertruck did is a sign that, you know, anywhere it goes, it's going to be a conversation starter. And there's nothing more you want from a branding standpoint than want people talking about your, 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 your product, you know? And so I think Cybertruck's going to do this better than anyone um, or any car that, that Tesla's done prior. So. Yeah. 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 I lived in, I lived in New York city for 15 years and it is hard to shock a New Yorker. And you see those, you know, talking uh, uh, on about what Matt was saying to have some, if, to have a New Yorker stop and turn their head, it takes a lot. When I, when I, I, I lived on the Upper East Side, I went to school on the Upper East Side and uh, my buddy Justin and I were walking down the street and it was broad daylight, just to give you an example of how little New Yorkers are faced by things. And there is this character that lived on the Upper East Side known, na- known as the Phantom Pooper. And the person was famous for, or infamous for pooping on the sidewalk in broad daylight in front of everyone. And the first time we came about this person, this has a point, I swear. The first time my, my friend Justin and I came, well, we saw, we like stopped and we couldn't believe what we were seeing. It was broad daylight. And then we looked around, like, is anyone seeing this? And people just walked straight by. They practically were brushing shoulders with the person and they didn't care. They didn't have time for that. So this, the, the, the Cybertruck did something that the Phantom Pooper could not do, and that was take a New, have a, a New Yorker snap out of them, their snap out of themselves, and actually take in and be like, "Whoa!" and stop in their tracks. Um, maybe that's a very crude example, but it just goes to show, like crazy stuff happens in New York. Crazy stuff that that you is is shocking and new yorkers do, are not phased no, but so to see to, so to see that video it was like a ufo landing i mean this yeah. this this kind of um these raw it was, it was almost like um cloverfield <laughs> you know that right. that sci-fi movie where it's, they're filming this sci-fi event that's happening in the city i won't give too much away but it's it's kind of through a first person perspective. That's kind of the beauty of it because they're th- shooting it with their phone, and then you see this thing that's otherworldly roll by, and everyone just stops, and it's this it's this very genuine moment of they're like, "What is that thing?" You know, and, uh, and imagine don't... times that by a million. You know, you know? imagine yeah, when there don't... are a million cyber trucks rolling around. Yeah. Don't don't you think it's strange to find out now that Matt was the phantom pooper? Isn't that just weird? <laughs> a weird so, coincidence. It's so it's so awkward. I knew yeah. he, he looked oh, from man. there. I got to Yeah. You. And I'm putting, I'm putting two, <laughs> two, two together. That's yeah. He left the city in questionable circumstances. Yeah, yeah. Um, it all makes sense now. No. Oh man. Uh, so the but seriously the the funny thing the thing now on Twitter is call, saying that the the Cybertruck looks like CGI and, you know, people don't believe it's real. It looks like CGI uh, pictures, videos, like, but that that's sort of how it is, right? I mean, that seems to be how it is. Like, it looks so out of this world that even in real life, it looks like CGI is rolling down the street, right? And um, yeah, and that's New York City. So what's it going to do in Kansas or, you know, Lakewood Ranch or, you know, whatever? It's going to be it's going to be a shocker. And, you know, I come back to one of the first articles I wrote about it where I said it's going to make um, make the Ford F-150 and those other kind of trucks look like Barbie Jeeps. Um, they're just going to look so... They, it's, I mean, no offense to them, but they're going to look a little bit less, you know, manly, stereotypically manly co- compared to the stainless steel, uh, like Armageddon monster yeah. and uh i like the, i like david's what a david always p- points out is that we cover our our vehicles well i'll let you say it since it's your observation yeah like paint paint is so is is so um uh what would you call dainty <laughs> it's like paint is like uh, what we talked about this yeah it's like paint is like nail polish but for a car you know it's like oh must it mess up the nail polish you know so you have these big tough trucks with this like sparkly paint. <laughs> and I love that the Cybertruck doesn't have to play into that. It's like, who cares if something bangs against it? Who cares? I mean, you, you can have a guy with this, you know, a 50, 60, 70,000 
GMC or Ford, but it's got this like, you know, metallic paint and something bangs against it. They're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? and does not relevant with the Cybertruck. That's that's why I, the Cybertruck for me is going to be the ultimate road trip car for me. That's what I'm my primarily because you're not worried about uh, road debris, uh, chips, rock chips, uh, um, parking it in New York City. I have a lot of friends in New York City going there this summer to visit um, to visit friends. Um, uh, when I used to live in New York City, I had a buddy. He had a 1994 uh, Dodge uh, Ram truck. It was a club cab, um, and it was a five-speed automatic. The, the shifter was like a yardstick. It was like three feet tall. <laughs> like, and I was living in um, off of Mulberry Street in, in Little Italy at the time, and I would parallel park that thing on Mulberry Street. Now imagine parallel parking a club cab of pickup truck five-speed manual at night uh in in you know in the in new york city um and and that's not yours i was like man i'm gonna i'm gonna hit a i'm gonna hit a of a, 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 a fire hydrant or another car or someone's gonna hit me with a cyber truck it's like who cares it all of that you don't you can you can park it there and it's built like a vault nobody's breaking into the cyber truck no, you know, you, you can put stuff in the bed. They call it a vault for God's sake. I mean, so when you're traveling, you're not worried about someone breaking into your car. You, you can park in the South Bronx. You don't care. So that's what I love about it too. Is this? It's got this ruggedness that, by design, no no other car has ever had. It's gonna yeah, be fascinating to see hit the market because we have all these impressions of what we think, but we we don't even know what the once you put a new invasive species into the wild, you don't know how that affects the ecosystem, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. But on that topic, um, uh, uh, and just re regarding the parking, I think it, even for those who, who've never lived in New York City, um, we have seen the Seinfeld episodes, I'm sure that uh, that <laughs> have a lot of fun parking, uh, parking comedy. Uh, but Matt, just on the topic of customers, one thing that I'm especially excited about with the Ford F-150 Lightning is it will have comparable specs in some degree to the Cybertruck, but it's really a totally different thing. So you know the you know the Tesla community, the buyer community so well from all the aftermarket products you sell. Maybe speak a little bit to what you expect as far as uh, competition versus co-opetition versus, you know, allies in in decarbonizing. Uh, what, do, what do you think these two different buying communities are going to sort of be like well i think you know i think that well i think at the end of the day the ford f-150 has this this legacy of being number one and i i do think this is and me being a tesla fanboy and super super into tesla i think from what we've gathered from the ford f-150 lightning they really are coming to play ball they're coming at a great price point specs are really comparable um so I think they're gonna they're gonna get a, a big market share very quickly. What they're what they're they're gonna have trouble with is that they're launching. They say in 2022, I guess 2022, but probably at the end of the year, and it, so it'll probably be really production will roll out 2023, right? So this year you're gonna get Rivian and the Cybertruck to market, and I think if the Cybertruck's numbers are six, 700,000 pre-orders and those start rolling out next year, you know, it's going to be an uphill battle a little bit for Ford to play catch up. Um, if the word gets out that the Cybertruck is spectacular, which I think it is going to be spectacular. I think it'll be Tesla's best, best vehicle. Um, so I think that's the, that's the thing. I mean, in terms of different market segments, yeah, they're radically different, but I think, where Ford is going to have to play catch up is just the timing of this whole thing, you know? Um, but in terms of the markets themselves, yeah, they're very different. I think, I think the Tesla buyer is more tech into tech. And I think the Ford buyer is more into utility, but I think Elon being Elon, like in his Joe Rogan podcast, who talked about attack vectors, right? What attack vectors do I have to deal with as Elon Musk? What attack vectors does Tesla have to deal with? And how do I, jump out in front and handle those attack vectors early. So the Cybertruck has tremendous utility. So he's sort of taking that away from the Ford F-150 by having all the utility that, that it does have already. So 
again, playing into the attack vectors that may come from some of these other brands, he's already sort of taking care of those up front. So I think that's going to be interesting. You know, if people want to sort of say, okay, I like this po apocalyptic, crazy look of the Cybertruck and I like the utility of it. And then suddenly you may get buyers uh, coming into the Tesla sort of umbrella that you never thought would be in the Tesla, you know, sort of world. So going to be interesting. David, same question for you and, we'll, and then we'll wrap up. Yeah. Oh, I think what Ford has going for it too, and we discussed this a little bit before, is the, the familiarity both with brand, but also with design. Yeah, I'm very active on both the Tesla forums and the Ford Mach-E forums. Uh, and I don't go there to troll as a Tesla fanboy. Like I legitimately, I talk about charging. I talk about charging solutions to, uh, to advocate purchasing the Mach-E. I want people to, to see that it is a good choice and have, have, make sure they make an informed decision. Uh, a common theme, is that Tesla's innovation is kind of a double-edged sword because at one at one end their designs are um, there's nothing like it the the bold move of of the one screen with all the information on it but it but it's also very as we all know it's it's very polarizing so a lot of it's a very subjective choice a lot of the time for Mach-E where to basically abbreviate these people's choice like the Tesla is just too weird for some people it's right. just they, they need a binnacle, they need a drive binnacle display right in front of the wheel. Uh, they, need, they need knobs and switches. These are things that they, they desire because they're familiar with it. And like we said, with the, with the Mach-E, you can get in it and you know how to drive right away. Like my dad, you know, who's you know, 80 years old, he could get in the Mach-E and go, oh, there's a dial just like my Chrysler Pacifica. And there's the speed just like every car I've ever had. Uh, you get into Tesla, you have to like know to press down and know to press up. I mean, heck, when you get in the when the Model S, you, there's no stocks. Like, if if no one tells you how to drive that car, the person's just going to sit there, and panic. So, with I think the to, to answer your question, what what Ford has, you know, you'll get they the F one fifty is already hit, and this kind of if it ain't broken, don't fix it. Just you know, make it electric. I mean, it's great. There are, people are going to be like, well, there are going to be these kind of traditionalists who are like, now this is a truck. It's not some kind of wacky spaceship looking thing, which, um, which, which, which will bode well for them. Because the fact of the matter is, some people just are not going to get a Tesla for several reasons. But one of them at a fundamental level is it's the way it looks and the, the it's just going to be too radical. So I, I think the, um, the Ford offerings are, it's a it's a great kind of um bridge into electric but, but the cyber truck is not as weird as tesla's other vehicles <laughs> yeah no i i think that's really uh i think that's a big thing my, my you know my vision is like qu quickest overall ev adoption as possible right and i what i like here is that yeah there will be some people who might have bought one or the other who will switch um but for the most part, I feel like they're, they're very different audiences. Like, I, I do agree, Matt, with what you said. If the Cybertruck comes out and it's a hit for a year, that could take buyers from Ford. You know, if it's viral for a year, that could be a big deal for Ford, something to watch out for. But on the other hand, you know, there's a lot of people who think the Cybertruck is super ugly. It's these new, young, crazy tech kids. Uh, they just want a good truck. And... Um, and there's just people who prefer, okay, I like the Ford brand. I, I like the Tesla brand. Uh, so I think there will be some differentiation. And they're, the really the biggest thing I'm curious about is if this beats the pants off of a Ford Raptor and you can get one for $32,000 at a really low cost of ownership, you know, two sides of the coin there, you're, you're beating to the, the biggest, the quickest Ford F-150 in history, becoming the new quickest and on the low cost side, you're really competitive, then how many Ford F-150 buyers are going to say, hey, I'm ready to go electric with Ford. So I'm really curious to see what it does to the F-150 and Ram, and, you know, and this kind of market. But uh, any final words on electric pickup trucks? Um, any final uh, last, last sentence or two from each of you? Yeah, I, I want to just say one thing that I think I'm very excited about with the, with the Ford F-150 Lightning, and that is that the, okay, so uh, where do I start? Well, most importantly, I think, I haven't seen a brand really take their marquee 
vehicle to market as electric. So the Mustang was wonderful. It has the it has the nameplate Mustang, but it's an S. It's a Mustang SUV, right? So it's not. It just does. It's not the Mustang. So what I found kind of disappointing was I just wish it was just the Mustang. Make the Mustang electric. You've got a winner mm-hmm. right there. If you're GM, make the Corvette electric. You've got a winner right there. It's it's, it's going to be a huge statement for your brand, and super exciting. So Ford, I am so excited that they took their 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 biggest nameplate, you know, the F-150, and just said, let's just do it. Let's do it electric. Like, you know, no, no sort of remix of it. You know what I mean? It's just the Ford F-150 as as an electric um, uh, variant um, or version. And the specs are spectacular. Like you said, it's beating the Raptor. Um, so, I mean, I think a lot of people are going to be really, really intrigued by this and it's going to have a good, uh, opportunity, uh, for Ford and just for the EV revolution in general to, to be accelerated and for people to really get excited about going electric. So I'm, I'm very excited that this is the first time I've seen, you know, a, a, a big nameplate like the F-150, you know, that's not sort of remixed like the Mustang Mach-E was you know, just taking it and making it electric and see what happens. I'd love to see BMW do that with their three series, you know? Um, I think that would be amazing. You know, I'd love to see the S-Class go electric for Mercedes. Um, I just think that those moves by traditional automakers are going to be game changers. And I think the first one to do it is Ford and I'm super excited about it. And I think it's going to be a big deal. So, yep. That's a really interesting comment. Really, I hadn't thought in that way about that is really really interesting uh david yeah the what will be really interesting is the transition at a dealership level both from education but and then the transition of core competency from the manufacturer so what happens when you have the ford f-150 gas on the lot and the ford f-150 lightning electric on the lot how is the dealer going to present those two you know, are they going to have some type of proactive program? Are they just, is it going to be on the onus of the dealer? And there's a lot of things that factor in, you know, um, like where, do we know where the lightning's being built? Um, it's being built in the United States. Okay. So, sorry. Um, I think in the, Detro- I'm not sure. Oh, okay. So, but anyway, yeah, I'm sure that will come, you know, they'll get that information, but it'll be very interesting at a dealer level because I always said, like, who's who's going to buy a Ford Escape when there's a Mach-E? Like, who, who buys an Escape? You want a midsize hatch? Get a Mach-E. It's, like, better in every way. Like, why the hell would you buy an Escape? So, you know, wh- when you're a dealer, how do you... How do you reconcile those things? How, how do you do it when 80% of your profit model is the service and maintenance of the internal combustion engine? How do they change their profit models? And how, does that, how is that dynamic when they want to entice a, the buyer knowing that, oh, they'll have to come in for oil changes and spark plugs and brakes and belts for this one. So that's a moneymaker for us. Here's one that's superior for every, in every other way. How do they truly advocate for the buyer? That's what's going to be really interesting because, you know, we t- when you talk about we want to accelerate this transition, so much of the buck stops at the dealer. And what we're seeing with the Mach-E is the consumer is basically hopscotching the dealer. They're basically fine. I know I want it. What dealer has it? And they're like, hey, dealer, hey, what's up? I know I have to go through you because that's the way it works, but I already know I want the Mach-E. I don't think anyone's going in there and the dealer's like, let me sell you a Mach-E. <laughs> that's not happening. The people are already coming in there, you know? So it'll be interesting to see like how... Yeah, you know what I mean. I could go on and on about it, yeah. but that that'll no, be interesting to see how that works. Similarly, that's a fascinating comment, and it actually, you know, links with Matt. Like, because it's their bread and butter model, and Ford is clearly going to show it's quicker than the Raptor, so they're going to sort of pull the Tesla approach of saying, "This is you want performance. This has performance. You want utility. This has backup power." You know, they're gonna the Ford corporate is going to put it on a good level i think and then the dealers are so used to selling f-150s it seems like they're gonna have to think you know this is amazing (laughs) like this is awesome like this is let's show this off on the other hand there is the the dual you know the 
you know, the issue of profit motive and also, you know, easy sale. It's easy to sell someone who just has had 10 F-150s, another F-150, uh, not electric, you know. But th- those are both fascinating comments. I think those are awesome takeaways. I'm glad I ha- asked for a takeaway comment because those are really interesting. Uh, but thank you guys both. Um, we're, we're, I think we're all really excited to see the F-150 Lightning arrive. It's a it's a monumental moment in the EV market in the US. Um, and I would say globally because of the, the F-150s role globally, uh, not in other markets, but just as such a top seller. Um, yeah, very fascinating, uh, exciting stuff. I'm sure we'll have more to talk about with it in the months to come. Thank you guys. Have a good day. You too. Thanks, Zach. See you, See you guys. Okay. Take care, guys. Take care.